great. So thank you everyone for joining us for another session of On Art Conversations with the Artist. Today, we're really excited to be joined by Karen Olivier, whose work is on view now at the Delaware Contemporary in our platform gallery on the exterior of the building. Karen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, um, you know, these are pretty informal and I just wanted to start with, you know, could you tell us a little bit about your background and maybe your experience and how it's led to the body of work that's on view at the museum? Sure, I was born in Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. Um, I came here when I was young, I, we moved to Brooklyn. Um, and I think that, kind of, and, and then after that, I went to Dartmouth College and I actually studied psychology. I didn't study art, art kind of came later. I was a store manager at Urban Outfitters in New York City and I just wanted a night out of the store. So, so I started taking ceramics classes, continuing ed classes. And after a couple of years, I had a, one of the teachers, instructors said, I should think about it more seriously. So I decided to kind of quit my job, quit my life, move to Philadelphia to take ceramics classes. And then I went on to grad school. So yeah, so my background's kind of, I kind of came to art late. What I was thinking about well, my liberal arts background, I think, has kind of informed my practice. I, my major was psychology, but I also think um, being from another country, even though I, I'm, I feel as I'm, I'm definitely American, I think about how I think about art making. I, I realize it's partly informed by being from a country where there's, an, you, you think about objects and their use and their function, but there's a kind of infinite mutability about objects and how you can use them. I think about carnival, and how it's in this strange thing happens where everyone, doesn't matter who you are, what class you are, what demographics, what race you are, it, it's a moment where everyone can kind of become someone else. There's a, this utter agency or this utter um, ability to tr for transformation. I think about the simplest thing you need. You just need a mask and some wire, a piece of cloth and wire, and you can become a, a bat. You can totally become another creature. You know, so I think that idea of like the mutability of objects, the mutability of things, or the idea that objects and forms and materials have inherent power and agency. We have agency and we can kind of shift and transform them to, to be something else. Um, yeah, so that idea about this mutability, about something could always, the, the kind of the, the never ending, like, what if that proposition. So I think about, so I think that kind of led me to, to think so how I work the way I work I love that um because I also am very interested in the history of objects things that um the way the meaning of an object can change based on the context so there's mm -hmm. so much there when we take objects and put them in museums there's the relatability of objects that are things that from our daily life that become an artifact that tell a story um but I'm so interested in your you know, going from ceramics to the various medium that you work in now. Could you talk a little bit about that journey or um, how your process was? Sure. About? Yeah, it's a funny thing. I mean, I think clay is a, what's beautiful about clay, it's, I mean, it's dirt, it's from the earth. It's, it's, it's been around for millennia. I mean, it's, it's this material that we all have some sort of relationship to. I think about how literally the earth is holding history. Um, it's, hold, it's a holding like hidden past that we'll never know of, but at the same time, it's very present and current. So I love the idea about this material that we all have some sort of relationship to. So it was, it was a kind of amazing to go to use clay and I was making, you know, like a typical potter. I made a lot of objects and a lot of vessels and things to contain and hold. And I kept thinking how ah, I started to switch suddenly after one semester in grad school, I started making installations. And I remember someone saying to me, well, that's a leap from making a, from vessels. And I thought, not really. I was thinking, I was reading the poetics of space at the time. And I was thinking about how, you know, a vessel, a cup is, it's holding sustenance, it's holding food, it's holding nourishment, but it's also holding our imaginary, it's holding our desires. And I was thinking, well, a container, a room is like a container that could hold this past, this presentness, this you know, you're holding a cup, you're very much aware of being alive and the heat in your hand and being in a space. You're also aware of the context and what's happening in that room kind of can inform your, your emotional state, your kind of psychological state. 
So in a way, I thought there was a lot of similarity between, say, the, the containment that happens in a ceramic vessel and what happens in a in a in an architectural space. I love that segue too, because I think in our work we think a lot about, you know, the museum is the container for the art or in my case, the experiences that happen with the art in the space. And your work at the Delaware Contemporary right now is on the exterior of the building. What has it been like? And I know you've done other public commissions too. Well, I haven't done anything like this. This feels very new. I mean, when I make work, I love making public art, but I've often done work that's more in the round or three-dimensional or installation-based. Um, so doing a work, work that was kind of flat was a new thing. I mean, when I, when I, I usually feel like there's a somewhat of a challenge or in my, when I'm thinking about what does it mean to make work in a gallery or, or museum? And I'm always thinking, yes, I'm, the work has to be, a, I want the work to be this catalyst or this tool or this site for discourse, or how do I make, when we come together in a gallery space, this is for any artwork, not necessarily just mine, but what would it mean for us to think about the gallery as a, as a community or the people who are there with us, the guards, the other visitors, the artworks, what would it mean for us to be a community? Or what does it mean now for the objects? Like in a way we imbue the objects with power. In a way we have the agency. So for me, like thinking about that and then thinking about the exterior and I, by chance I had to go down to DC. No, I went down to Maryland. Um, so I was getting my global entry and I was on the Amtrak and I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna pass it. And it was amazing to see it. So it was amazing for me to know that people entering the, the museum it's almost this invitation or it's an invitation, but it's also giving you, it's both in the, on the exterior, but it's also um, objects that, it's also landscape. So it's landscape, so it's, that's also something on the exterior, but there's each of the pieces has something to do with the interiority. So I was thinking that's like kind of an interesting place to land. So I was thinking about this idea of it being an invitation, but I also like the idea that someone's on a train and, they're not expecting to have an art experience. Like the incidental viewer is always exciting for me. The passerby who's not intending to have an art experience, and then all of a sudden something is presented to them that may make them may stick with them. It may just be a fleeting smile. It could be something that's potentially indelibly imprinted. Maybe they see an image that kind of speaks to a a memory of say last summer, a time when we could be all together. Or maybe it's about loss, or maybe it's a it's a, a future looking thing that you can imagine, you know, being on a river. So yes, I love this site, even though I, I don't do, I do some phot photographic work to do something on this scale where when you think about banners too, there they're often can be advertisements, you know, it's in a way it's announcing. So I was thinking, what does it mean to announce with things that are familiar, a waterfall? a river, clothing, and uh, maybe there's some sort of mystery and there's some elusiveness to the work, but it's in a way things that we're familiar with. So it could make you, so no one in a way could be alienated. I think there's a push right now for museums where they're thinking, how do we have the, you know, the, the swath of demographics feel like this is theirs? And for me, I mean, I've been always thinking about the familiar as a way to enter in because I, you know, I wasn't an artist who came up with fantastical worlds. It was always like, what is right before me? And how do I maybe shift how we perceive it or kind of open up what is known about it or, or allow a space for something else to enter? I'm always in the, the, the realm of the what if. I absolutely love that. We do not have enough time today for all of the <laughs> questions and philosophical conversation I want to have with you now. Um, but again, I love what you're saying about, you know, people bringing the story of an object and what that is, and then it's in the museum and what is that meaning? And then now it's on the exterior of the museum. And it's, I think it's doing a lot of different things for visitors in the community or visitors passing by, there's so much there, you know, that's taking the museum and almost objectifying it a little bit too. But our museum- I, mean, I also would love to hear how people are responding. I mean, I was on the train, so I had just a quick moment, but I am curious. I mean, I'm gonna come down in a couple of weeks, but I'm curious, uh, has there been a response or, or what the response 
has been or what kind of narratives is it potentially opening up? It's been wonderful to have these banners on the building. So it's been about two years now almost. Um, so June, June 5th will be two years that we've been doing the banners on the exterior of the building. And I think it really has, you know, what you're saying about it becoming an advertisement or an invitation. And particularly with contemporary art, I think it's so mystifying to some people or it's been so exclusive, exclusionary to so many people and not even just the art as an object, but the spaces too that have contained it. Museums historically being so, um, you know, exclusionary in different capacities. And then you add the layer of interpreting contemporary art and what barriers that adds. Um, so having had the work on the building, I do feel like it's been like, you know, kind of cracking the museum open and turning it inside out a little bit. And we've had, you know, lots of people love seeing the work on the exterior and that moment on the train, we took the train to AU as a staff the other week, and we were so excited to pass our own building and see it from a new, um, a new perspective and seeing your work, we we're all just like huddled in the same window waiting to go buy it. Um, I love it, I love it, I love it. Yeah, yeah. I, was thinking, I was thinking about that too, like the idea of, I think often about movement, be it uh, displacement of people or migration or objects, how they end up in our homes from Amazon, from a ship, from a, you know, going to a store, you're walking yourself. And I was also thinking about like the waste stream and I think about like travel and I think about even more so now that we're, we're able to kind of move around more. So I was thinking about like movement as one thing I was thinking about and how the ways of seeing it, you're walking past it, you're driving by it. And all those experiences would kind of potentially elicit different things because of, because of, the, because of the way your gaze can happen. And I was also thinking a lot about time being tied to that, this idea of movement where in a way the pieces are dealing with maybe historical time, with geological time, with personal time. So I was thinking about how what that means for these things that maybe we subconsciously know uh, that we're constantly engaging and we're, we're kind of in our mortality and all those things we could talk about, but where time is constantly passing, but what does it mean to kind of reflect on something that's having different, different speeds of time, different speeds of entropy, different speeds of um, longevity. Um, so yes, yeah, so I was hoping that these pieces kind of speak to that because they're on the outside and people will kind of pass by them and you know, it's always a new movement in relationship to the, to the banners. Yeah, I love that. And thinking about conceptually how that, con that idea of movement is really integrated into the pieces and the subject matter too um, is really powerful. And our building is just about a hundred yards away from a riverfront too. So I think that's really interesting kind of bridging with the imagery and then thinking about our environment. Could you talk a little bit more, like, was that a conscious choice with the movement and the location we're juxtaposed yeah. the river or did it just happen that way? No, I definitely, I mean, with my work, I tend to, I say it's because I am, I'm like a fake artist where I don't have like, I don't have like imagining things in my mind. It always has to be rooted in a place. I feel as though I have to be rooted in place, which then means I'm rooted to history, I'm rooted to a culture, I'm rooted to the people who live there. So I, before I could even do anything, think of the idea, I really had to do research and I researched and researched thinking about that location and the riverfront um, and its history became like a, that was the thing. And I knew I wanted to kind of tie the works, all had to kind of address water, um, water in some way. Um, that's so interesting. Was there anything, um, you know, surprising that came out of your research when you were kind of, you know, digging in and coming up with the concept? Was there anything? Um, well, I remember reading about it because I was trying to do, I, at first I was gonna, I was, researching all these narratives and reading about, is it the most um, Southern beginning of the, the Underground Railroad? I was reading all this stuff about the Underground Railroad and St. Christina, the Swedes, and I was trying to, there's all this stuff and I was reading about the history of, what was the name of one of the rivers? And I start, start, was thinking I wanted to do something with, I'm sorry, it's been many, many months since I did this research. 
And then I just felt as though I was getting a little too tight too. In my attempt to make this site generate generative or site, site dependent, I think I was getting so close in onto what those potential narratives are that could be um, politically um, important. So I decided to just kind of, in a way, step back and say, what is here and what's the experience of someone who might have to pass by it every day and see these banners? What can I offer that could allow them to keep seeing it differently? Or someone who's coming to see it, you know, only sees it once. So I think I just had to shift it to being, how could I have you imagine very, maybe specific narratives or your personal bi biography, but then have these things that we kind of all share. So this, the specific becomes the universal. So I had to pull away from my kind of direct political you know, like history I was looking at, but I realized in the works, there's, there's um, the politics are perhaps more nuanced, but they're, in, they're embedded in the work. And I didn't need to say Harriet Tubman, per se. That's so interesting, that process of revising and editing and, you know, where an artist kind of pulls back or pushes forward. And I know you said you called yourself a fake artist, but those are the creative skills that are shared across artists, no matter where they come from or what their story or background is. So that's so interesting to me because, you know, there's no such thing as a fake artist. Doing. <laughs> well, that thing where, like, I feel as though for me, I, I almost have to start with something that's there. Um, so I think that's my thing. I, I don't kind of imagine, if you gave me a blank canvas, I wouldn't know what to do. I could start with a photograph and figure out how to kind of manipulate or rearticulate that. But um, starting with nothing, for me, I can never, the whole idea like artists start with nothing to make something. I have to start with something to maybe make nothing or to maybe make something else. But um, for me, it's hard to kind of start with nothing. Like well, I need something to rub up against. There's something to wrestle with. Like, I think I'm always thinking about like, you know, those dichotomies, you know, um, soft, hard, public, intimate, macro, micro, invisibility, invisibility, fragment, whole, um, you know, present, presentness, absence. And with those things, it's, they're always tied to a person, a place, an object, a material, a form. So for me, it's, uh, I'm so tied to the things, the things we surround ourselves with by choice or by, by force. There's so much there. Um, <laughs> I love it. I, um, I was just going back to the river and the landscape and then that juxtaposition of the river with the textile and you know, I was thinking again, you know, the creative skills of an artist or your eye there, for me, there's something so engaging about that contrast or even, you know, the colors and the textiles next to the natural environment. Could you talk a little bit more about that relationship or, you know, what that process was like for you composing the actual images? Yeah, it was um, when I finally realized I was, I was going to do photographs and I think I was getting caught up in the, the text becoming too graphic designing. And I was like, no, I want it to be photographs. Um, so once I decided on that, I started, again, I started with, with something I had. I, I looked at three artworks um, that I've made, three sculptures. And I was thinking, how can I take an element of them or a detail and then in that insert something else uh, in a way, almost like creating, creating these inversions. So like the one with the, the river, that horizontal, that the clothing is from a piece called Fortify. Um, and in the front of the, the, the sculpture, maybe we can show images of that on this. Um, it's at the front of the sculpture, you see bits of clothing, you see this huge wall of these bits of clothing coming through. And then when you turn the back, it's like this you know, tsunami of clothing. And every time I, when I showed this work, people kept referring to things like waterfall or tsunami and these water references that it was kind of like this, the, the, it, it was a static sculpture, but it felt as though it was moving. It, was, it read like it was water coming down. So, and then, so something about that made me think of that intense gravity and the stream of water kind of falling down. And I thought, what would it be for me to kind of insert almost like an opening, a slit into seeing something else. And then I thought, 
what if it's a river, which is also, we think about it being kind of like linear and kind of narrow. I mean, they're wide rivers, but thinking about that, but then if I showed you as a horizontal and the width, all of a sudden there's an inversion that's happening in them. And then I was thinking about what is it to this? Something about, um, there's something about them where they're kind of doing, they're both, they're both, they're, one is, you know, clothing and on our body, bodies, but our bodies can also move on a river. So there's something about them kind of taking on each other's roles or something. Does that make sense at all? It does make a lot of sense, um, you know, and I think too, uh, just and the, again, title, I, the title was important. I was like, I try to figure out that all the titles, I think all the titles relate to water. This one in particular relates to the sea, it's called Evulsion. And that's when the river channel switches, switches location and often like kind of abruptly, switches location often it's abruptly um, along its course. So I was thinking about it being a term that's related to the river, but all, in a way the clothing is doing, <laughs> is doing that thing that, that normally land is doing. So I kind of went and the idea of this, um, this abrupt, it's almost like this rupture. And it's, what does it mean to have this almost like this acute, something that's acute, but it's also a rupture, but both of the objects, the river and the clothing are kind of, you think about them as a smooth <laughs> moving through. So this thing is being almost like, inc like incised in or cutting through or something. I love that I'm brainstorming in my head here too, like the vocabulary that I would use to describe the movement of water and how often too, that's the vocabulary you would, as you're alluding to, use to describe the movement of clothing too, whether it's on a large scale, like a tsunami or a waterfall or a smaller scale, rippling, undulating, um, curving, these words. And I love the Venn diagram of them intersecting in you know, contemporary art or, or a concept too. That's so interesting um, oh, to me. Um, and the color, I, I decided to go with sunset because um, I think I was thinking about, there's something funny about that um, time of day, you know, what's it, the French, when dog turns to wolf, where things are, are less discernible or things aren't totally understood. And there's this transformation, this moment of, like you watch the sunset and it feels almost, um, like time is, you know, time is moving, but at the same time, it feels like it's standing still. We're having these almost like heightened paying attention to those colors. And then you could blink and miss <laughs> the sun disappearing. So there's something about that, how that sunset, and then also just, you know, compositionally, I wanted to have something where it would be reflecting colors that are being reflected because of the sky, because of something outside of itself and how that would relate compositionally to all the colors that are happening, almost like accumulation of the colors that are happening with the clothing. That kind of magical golden hour. Yeah. Um, there is something really, uh, I don't know, people fall in love with that, that mm -hmm. color scheme or that, um, that time of day. And we were just thinking about uh, that with the seasons. My husband and I were talking about how soon you know, the trees will be all the way green. It'll be like you wake up one morning and they've gone from these kind of barren twigs to this luscious green landscape. And similarly, you know, you'll blink and it'll have happened. And there's right. that kind of passage of time. And I love how you also were bringing that back to, to water too, and the passage of time or a moment. Um, and I guess one of my other questions for you is what else, you know, if, as time is rolling on and you know, what other projects are you working on or what else do you have going on that we can be looking forward to? Um, um, this summer, I'm gonna be finishing up a memorial. Um, it's a memorial that will be at Stenton House in Philadelphia. And Stenton House was the home of James Logan, who's an important um, figure in Philadelphia, the right-hand man to William Penn. He was the mayor at one point, a, a serious um, scholar. Um, did really important things in Philadelphia, but he's also a slave owner. Um, so there's this, this story goes, so he had this slave named Dinah who eventually was freed and was still a servant in his home. During the Revolutionary War, um, um, soldiers, the British soldiers had come to that area of Stenton House and they were, they were burning down the, the mansions. So they came to the door and Dinah was there and they said, gather your things. Um, we're gonna set this um, house on fire. Where do you have hay? So she points into the direction of the hay. At the same time, 
um, the British police come looking for um, soldiers who are, um, what's it called, deserting. And she says, they're in the barn. So they get arrested and the Stenton house is saved. So the amazing thing about it is that in 1919, I believe it was, um, there was a plaque dedicated to her. Um, but then you realize that the plaque, it's amazing there was a plaque that was honoring a, a, a former slave, but it was almost honoring her, it, 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 it only honored her in reference to the act of what she did saving that saving this um, white man's house. So a call came out to to make a, a memorial. So I'm excited that I was chosen for that. And I'm making this amazing, I'm so excited about this memorial because it was so tied to me, the fact that there was so little information about Dinah out there that I was kind of, I kept asking, writing down questions, questions, and the, the piece is basically composed of questions that I'm asking Dinah and in turn she, she will ask us. Um, so that's happening. That should be um, installed by the end of the summer. And then I was excited to win a commission to do a memorial in this neighborhood called Queen Village that honors um, this um, 19th century African-American burial ground. So I'm working on a, on a, a large memorial at this site as well, and that, that will be next summer summer 2023. So I'm excited to be working on these two memorials that are in Philadelphia and relate to, you know, I would say I'm not from Philadelphia, but to Black history. That's so so one, of the, one other thing I'm doing is I'm a, um, I was elected to be a, a artist in residence at Rare, this recycled artist, I mean, artist, recycled artist in residence at this, um, this site, this construction demolition Recycle Center in Philadelphia. And I was awarded it in 2020, but with the pandemic, I haven't really been able to spend time there. And it's kind of amazing because it's actually giving artists direct engagement with the waste stream. Um, and maybe consider a practice that's, um, considering I guess your practice with the lens of sustainability um, to kind of maybe thoughtfully kind of reassess um, your, your means of working. So I'm going to be working on that over the next year, being able to work at the site and kind of think of how I can make works kind of using the materials that some would end up in landfills and the rest would be recycled. How can I kind of insert myself into that, which is kind of perfect because I'm so into the idea of reuse and reimagining. So those are the main things that are happening over the next year. That's so exciting. I can't wait to see all of these come to fruition. <laughs> I think there's just so much there about how, you know, artists are telling stories and, you know, you're, you're doing this research and you're, you know, taking narratives and we all kind of understand ourselves through the story that we tell in our head, but then artists are, you know, illustrating these stories and giving new meaning to them and, and, you know, visually bringing them to people and then helping everybody understand the different facets of, of, you know, for me, it's an object, it's an art object, it's an artifact. And now you're, you're adding these other layers to it. So it's just so exciting. Thank you so much. We can't oh, wait to you. see everything else that you have going on. And thank you for taking the time to talk to 